Hi, everyone. In this episode of Replace the State, we get into the gory details of just how societies work and how you can change them. There are really two parts to this discussion. First, we talk about how societies work in general, and then second, we apply that discussion to why you can't just get rid of governance altogether. So in this video, we are going to look at a powerful way of thinking about societies and changing them. The philosophy we'll talk about is called assemblage theory. It's a little complex, but that's why we'll use lots of pictures and cartoons. episode, we talked about why reform, voting, and demand-making protests won't bring us the world that we need. So, okay, if the state is such a problematic institution, why not just dismantle it, smash it, or drown it in a bathtub? Well, in this episode, we'll talk about why it's not quite that simple, and we will actually talk about how we have to replace power dynamics more than just eliminate them. The main point here is that while a given state or government may come and go, governance never goes away. Simply erasing a state from existence still leaves many structures and powerful actors in a society in place, some of whom may have their hands on lots of resources, weapons, and desires for domination. As we've seen in this world, many of the campaigns to diminish the power of states have been made not by people seeking equality and liberation, but by powerful corporations and individuals seeking even more unchecked power. So if totally demolishing systems of governance isn't a really uh, a practical goal, what is it then that we should strive to do? In the end, I believe that the question we have to answer is, what kinds of governance are we going to create and perform? And will that governance create healthy societies and environments and be inclusive? Or will we keep accepting systems of governance that continually enrich a tiny group of elites at the expense of everyone else on earth? So, to explain why we have to replace the state instead of smashing it, we have to take a couple of steps in this video. First, we have to talk about where things come from. Things like you, me, the places we live, states, and even ideas. Then we can talk about how this affects how we can and can't set up better forms of governance. Okay, let's dive in. So remember our discussion in episode 4 about structure versus agency? where we talked about how there are structures around that limit our ability to make decisions, like Mr. Penguin's ability to get liquor on a Sunday morning. Well, I alluded in that episode to the idea that any decision or action we do is actually affected by a whole bunch of structures at once. It isn't just one structure, like the law or state power or the logic of capital, that stops us from what we'd like to do or that stomps on our freedom. Instead, Actions are created in whole networks of pressures. It isn't that our actions are determined by one kind of structure or another, but are instead what we call overdetermined by a zillion things at once. Okay, so in the case of Mr. Penguin, whether he buys whiskey or not is the result of how a host of factors come together. We can say that Mr. Penguin, like all of us, is surrounded by an assemblage. So what's an assemblage? Well, it's a constellation of things, ideas, people, and forces that have effects on us. So in the example of Mr. Penguin getting liquor, he is being influenced by the law, the consequences of breaking it, and his perception of the likelihood he'd get caught, but also the economic pressure of whether he has the money to buy it. He also is influenced by his own body state, like does he crave it, or is he feeling sick and repelled by it? What about the effect it might have on his job? What do his family and friends think about what he does? Does he care? This one simple act is influenced by many threads, and it is important to note that not all of these structures are restrictions. Some of them enable and help produce a decision. A structure is therefore not just something which blocks or prohibits, it is also something which produces something. So because this assemblage of influences looks like the tangled webs of roots that grasses have, some social scientists call these assemblages rhizomes. Grass roots, rhizomes, do not have a central taproot, but instead are more like mats of fibers connected to multiple nodes. Some theorists then use this as a metaphor for how societies function, as well as what explains social and individual behaviors. For example, some older theories take the taproot approach and believe 
there is one main root reason a society is the way it is, whether it's the environment of that society, some kind of essentialized view of its culture, or capitalism, or its religion, or the state, etc. This all leads to all sorts of philosophical arguments, then, over which is the main factor that is the root of a society or a specific problem. These theorists then may argue over which structure is the primary one and which one, if changed, will change the whole society. This is actually where the meaning of the word radical comes from. It means to address something at the root instead of just reforming a society in a minor way. Now, in contrast to these different views that argue about what is at the root of a society, folks who take the rhizome or assemblage approach stress that there is no one master structure that drives all the others. Instead, these folks see societies and individuals within them as always complex tapestries woven together from multiple influences. How deep does this theoretical perspective get? Well, pretty deep. It even goes on to say that it is not just actions or behaviors that are governed this way, but things themselves. What kinds of things? Well, all of them. Our places, our cultures, our institutions, our ideas, and even ourselves. Let's dig into this for a second. Let's say we don't just want to know about whether Mr. Penguin will buy whiskey or not, but that we want to ask a more fundamental question. What, what is, is Mr. Mr. Penguin? Penguin? All right. So the more taproot-oriented ideologies might say that deep down he has an essence of what he really is. Then they might argue about just what that is. One person might say he is primarily his genetic code. Another might say he has a divinely created penguin soul, and that is the real him. Another person might say he is primarily the product of his upbringing in Antarctica, with a harsh climate, a conservative rookery, and doting parents. Some may say that he is essentially a good penguin or a bad penguin. Others would define him by his relationship to capitalism, like is he a worker or an owner penguin, and so on. So from the assemblage perspective, however, this argument over Mr. Penguin's essence is somewhat pointless and misses the big picture. That big picture is that he is all of these things woven together in a particular way. Assemblage theory basically says we shouldn't think about things as being either this or that, but instead we should use the logic of and, and, and. And by this I mean that to fully understand what Mr. Penguin is, we would have to look at his genetics and his upbringing and his moral values and his relationships to economic processes and his family and, and, and. Think about this for yourself. Who are you? Are you basically one main thing influenced by other small things? Or are you, both physically and mentally, all sorts of things related together in a certain way? Things like your parents' DNA, and your childhood joys, and your traumas, and the videos you watch, and the foods you ate from your first bites as a toddler to last night's pizza, and your hopes and fears, and what your friends influence you to do, and your gender, and the way people categorize your ethnicity, and, and, and. Who you really are, both body and soul, is a related mixture of things like a tapestry woven from a thousand different threads in a unique design that only you have. So, this may seem like an esoteric point, but it is a critical and crucial fact to consider when we are thinking about how the world is actually constructed and how it functions. This is because what is true for you as a person is also true for our neighborhoods, our ethnic groups, and our nations. All of these things are hybrids, When we go back to the beginning of any of these things, what we find is a coming together of all sorts of other stuff that isn't that thing, right? Nothing makes itself. So the reality is, is that any person, thing, or collective must arise from a coming together of other things. What is at the beginning of the nationality American, if not a collection of other things that were not American, but instead English, African, Irish, Spanish, Chinese, indigenous, etc. What is at the beginning of the nationality of English, if not the Angles, the Saxons, the Britons, etc.? In turn, those identities are themselves hybrids of still earlier groupings. It is also logical to assume that this process is still in effect. 
Someday, the identity labels we currently have will themselves morph into still other things that we have not yet imagined. So, in short, you are a tapestry. Your town is a tapestry. Elements of your identity are tapestries. Our economies are tapestries. Our ecologies are tapestries of both human and non-human elements. And even our systems of governance are tapestries. Now, some of the threads that make up these tapestries are ones we have chosen, some have been forced upon us, and in many cases, we are not even fully conscious that they are there, and we may have no idea just where they might have come from. The world has long been a complex, shifting, constantly mixing, hot mess. So if the world is made of assemblages of different kinds, why do some come to be and stick around and function for a while while others don't? And why are some around for a short time and then disintegrates and disappear? For instance, if we think about states as assemblages, we know that certain state apparatuses come and go. At one time, the Roman state dominated huge areas of the Mediterranean world, and then it unraveled, and it is now gone. Same is true for the Incan Empire, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the U.S. Confederacy, and many other states. In fact, if you look at old maps of Europe, you probably don't recognize half the names of countries. Where do they all go? Well, like all assemblages, they were subject to forces and drives that held them together, but also forces and differences that pulled them apart. Few assemblages last forever. They are held together for some period of time, and then centrifugal forces that make parts of it want to disconnect or combine with something else overcome the attractions holding it together. However, and this is the really important point, the fact that an assemblage goes away does not mean the elements that make it up disappear. Those elements are still there. They have just reorganized into other assemblages. Just like the Etruscans may no longer exist, but that's not because they all died. The people just joined into other ethnic groupings. Just as governance in Central Europe didn't cease when the Austro-Hungarian Empire ended, the people in the area shifted the form of the state and created different assemblages of governance. Even when a state is completely smashed by an enemy, a disaster, a pandemic, or whatever, the pieces then reassemble again in a new way. Why? Well, because the pieces, like you for instance, still want to reconnect. Because there are a lot of benefits for doing so. Political, economic, romantic, and social. Even in a cataclysm, other people are not going away. And like you, they want things. And it is easier, or going to be easier, to get things when people are in a coordinated group. You may think you'll run screaming into the hills yelling, FREEDOM! But your chances of survival and happiness really do depend on making some kinds of links with other people. How those connections are made, and the character and form of those connections, is what we need to think about forging in a thoughtful way. So, that's why you can't just simply smash the state, you have to replace it, and preferably before the existing state assemblage is destroyed. We have to develop decision-making assemblages based not on what we oppose about the current system, but based on the ethics and practices we do want, like inclusion, equality, justice, freedom, and sustainability. And we best construct those before the state is smashed or falls into crisis. This is sometimes referred to as a dual power strategy where decision-making structures are built alongside the existing state and which seeks to take over decision-making authority and then diminish the power of the existing state. The goal then is that even if the current state is corrupt and somewhat impervious to necessary change, we shouldn't necessarily claim we can end governance once and for all. Instead, our goal should be to produce an assemblage of governance that we actually want to participate in. So going back to our discussions of structure and agency, we could say that those of us who fight for inclusion, justice, freedom, and sustainability should not seek to abolish structures. We should want to build structures just ones that undo those systematic inequalities, injustices, and environmental destruction. So, the good news that we get from assemblage theory is that no particular social arrangement is either natural or inevitable. They are all just products of putting elements together in a certain way. Elements like you, me, 
ideas, resources, places, energy, hopes, fears, and dreams. This means that no arrangement of governance is permanent. We absolutely can change and replace them. In the next episode, we'll get into examples of just how people are doing this today.